Shot 17 of The Right Way to Do Wrong, an expose of successful criminals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The Right Way to Do Wrong, an expose of successful criminals by Harry Houdini. Shot 17. Cheating Uncle Sam. Under this heading I shall group such crimes as counterfeiting, and the kindred crimes of forgery and raising notes, as well as smuggling. It is a serious matter to get into trouble with the federal government. The criminal is pursued relentlessly, and the sentence when conviction follows the almost certain arrest is always a heavy one. For these reasons, such crimes are usually attempted only by the boldest and most skillful criminals, or by those whose positions of trust in government employ afford them special opportunities. The three great crimes against any government, aside of course from actual treason, are counterfeiting its money, either gold, silver, or bills, evading its custom laws, or smuggling. Counterfeiting, which offers enormous rewards if successful, is frequently attempted. Indeed, scarcely a month passes that does not see the appearance of some new and dangerous counterfeit of some United States bill. Notice is at once sent to all the banks by the authorities, and often published in the newspapers, so that the public at large may be warned against the spurious bill in circulation. Many years ago, when the art of engraving and plate-making was in its infancy, the paper money in circulation was much more crude than today. Then it was comparatively easy for the counterfeiter to engrave just as good a bill as the government could produce. But now the matter is much more difficult, owing to the delicate and intricate work of the lathe and tool work, and the special fiber paper upon which it is printed. The conditions of caution surrounding the government printing works make it almost impossible for an original plate to be stolen. The paper is made especially for this purpose and under strictest government supervision. In designing, lettering, and engraving the bills, only artists of the foremost professional standing are employed. Every banknote or greenback is truly a work of art, so that an exact counterfeit, one that will deceive even an ordinary businessman accustomed to handle money, is each year more and more difficult to produce. The counterfeits of silver and gold coins are mostly of two kinds, either molded or stamped with a die. The die-made counterfeits are usually much more difficult to detect if the metal employed has anywhere near the right weight, ring, and color. Electroplating is employed by counterfeiters with some success. One dangerous counterfeit now in circulation is a compound of antimony and lead heavily electroplated with silver. In this way, the gold $10 piece of 1858 and the gold $5 pieces of 1847, 1848, 1862, and 1869 have been counterfeited with a platinum coin heavily gold-plated. The most successful and therefore the most dangerous of all counterfeits are those composed of actual gold and silver, but with a mixture of metal. The actual value of the gold in the counterfeit $5 gold pieces dated 1881 and 1882 has been determined by assay to be $4.43. Genuine gold and silver coins are often tampered with. These schemes are known as sweating, plugging, and filling. For instance, a hundred gold $10 pieces subject to an acid bath would lose perhaps $35 or $40 worth of their gold and remain unchanged in appearance. The coins are put in circulation again, and the gold which has been sweated off of them is easily extracted from the acid bath and sold. Coins are also robbed of precious metal by drilling a hole the cavity being filled with an alloy, and the filling covered with a light gold wash. Filling a coin is sawing it through the edge in two parts, scraping out the gold, and putting the two parts together again filled with some base or metal. Thomas Ballard was the first counterfeiter to successfully reproduce government fiber paper, which he did in 1870. The next year he and his gang were captured, but escaped from jail and found a hiding place from which they continued to issue dangerous counterfeits. In 1873, his counterfeit $500 treasury note alarmed banks and government officials. Ballard was finally captured in his lair in Buffalo just as he was about to produce a counterfeit $5 bill of a Canadian bank. This bill, he boasted, was to have corrupted all Canada. 
John Peter McCartney was the counterfeiter who successfully removed all the ink from genuine one-dollar bills, so that he could secure government paper on which to print counterfeit bills of much higher denomination. He made a fortune, so it is said, but was brought to book at last. To a counterfeiter named One-Eyed Thompson is given the credit of being the first to transform bills of small denomination to larger by cutting and pasting. He also had an ingenious trick of cutting up $10 or $100 bills into strips and making 11 counterfeit bills of the same denomination. A German by the name of Charles Ulrich won the distinction of having produced the most dangerous Bank of England notes ever made. Langdon W. Moore, one-time expert, bank robber, forger, and counterfeiter, who is now reformed and is leading an honest life has written an interesting autobiography in which he tells of his own experience in raising notes, counterfeiting, and getting the counterfeits in circulation. At one time another gang of counterfeiters declared war on him. He sent a spy into the enemy's camp, learned where they were going to put out their next batch of queer, and then proceeded to carry out a plan for outwitting them. Postage stamp counterfeits are common enough, but mostly practiced to impose on the collectors of rare stamps. For instance, a certain issue of Hawaiian stamps are very valuable, as there are not supposed to be more than a half a dozen or so in existence, and when one is found it sells for thousands of dollars. One of the most daring stamp counterfeiters planted about twenty forgeries of this rare stamp into collections of wealthy philatelists and realized many thousands of dollars. Another daring gang introduced a beautifully engraved stamp into Paris by posing as the King of Sodang and Sweet. So dang being an island that existed solely in the imagination of the clever swindler. A stamp dealer was the principal victim, and paid the king a large sum of money for a number of the stamps of this fictitious kingdom. Speaking of stamps recalls a method of secret writing which defied detection. The plan was to put a fake letter inside the envelope, but to write the real message in microscopic characters in the upper right-hand corner and over this paste the stamp. The correspondent, who was of course in the secret, would simply soak off the stamp. This trick is often made use of by convicts who wish to send a secret message to their friends on the outside. Cancelled postage stamps are frequently washed and sold or used again. I have in my possession a receipt given me by a Russian convict, which will do this perfectly, removing every trace of the cancellation mark but leaving the stamp perfect. Such a secret is too dangerous, however, for general publication. On the continent I have known of a clever dodge being practiced which reaches the same result. Before the letter is mailed, the stamp is covered with a transparent paste. When the letter is received, the correspondent can simply wash off the stamp with water, and, of course, the cancellation marks with it. The penalty for this crime is so severe, and the reward so small, that not even hardened criminals are willing to risk the attempt. A clever gang of smugglers adopted this ruse in order to get their trunks through the custom house free. They had counterfeit labels made, such as an inspector places upon a trunk. Passing among the trunks where the inspectors were at work, they would slyly poke the inspected label on all their own trunks. Each official seeing the labels would suppose some other official had actually inspected the trunks and so would pass on to others. Instances might be multiplied, but all goes to show that dishonesty, whether to your fellow men or to the government, is the worst of all policies in the end. End of shot 17. Recording by Leanne Howlett.